Hi everybody, welcome back to Capricorn Radio. This is your host James and uh, my third show today. This has become quite an, an exciting week for me. I'm really glad to talk about today's subject because it's something uh, I've been aware of for quite a while and uh, I'm super excited to talk about today's guest. This is going to be talking to Mr. Len Caston. A little bit about Len before I bring him on. Um, Len Caston has a BA degree from Cornell University. That's where he majored in psychology. And he minored in literature and philosophy, so we're going to be guaranteed a good discussion today. Uh, after graduating from Corn Cornell, he entered the U.S. Air Force Aviation Cadet Program. And was there, uh, he experienced a UFO encounter that had a transformative effect on his life. Although he didn't realize until a few years later, uh, and after serving in the Air Force, he moved back to Richmond, Virginia. On frequent trips to Virginia Beach, he spent a lot of time in the extensive New Age Library at the Association for Research and Enlightenment, the ARE. Uh, the organization founded by psychic Edgar Casey, uh, who we've covered on a few shows, and uh, that's where he acquired a self education in metaphysics. He then moved to Boston, where he was introduced to theosophy and joined the Boston Theosophical Society. Then, later, while working in Washington, D.C., in the 60s, he felt drawn to join the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, that's known as NICAP. NICAP was the most prestigious organization in the country investigating UFO phenomena. Len then moved to Hartford, Connecticut, where he joined the American Philosoph Philosopher Society. And upon the death of the founder, Cyril Benton, Len became the president of the society. It's then in the 80s that the APS, under Len's leadership, commenced a program of weekly public lectures by prominent metaphysical and ufology researchers, writers and leaders. While living in Connecticut, Len became the editor of an early New Age publication, Metamorphosis magazine, co-founded with Gordon Michael Scallion. And uh, what a prolific uh, background of a bio to get into today. So many aspects there. Uh, if you want to follow uh, Len or have a look at his website, you can go to et-secrethistory.com and uh, you can catch everything he does there. Um, so without further ado, let's bring on today's guest. Hi Len, you're very welcome to the show. Hi James, nice to be with you. Oh, great to have you here. Len, what a wonderful background you have. Uh, philosophy, psychology, theosophy. Uh, you've even had a UFO account to yourself and uh, into the Air Force as well as a, as a cadet. Um, a lot of aspects to your personality uh, and background and life there, Len. Uh, which do I go to first? Uh, I, I guess the, the big one would probably be the UFO counter, but uh, to be uh, to be polite, I, I think it's best to know the person. Tell me about you as the psych psychologist, the philosopher, um, and what attracts you to that um, part of, part of uh, uh, education? I think I think that incident that I had in the Air Force, I think I was taken on board a, a craft, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't remember all the details. But I, evidently that's what happened, and uh, in my subconscious that 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 ex that incident was buried there until I joined NICAP in Washington, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I became very very interested in UFOs, and I had no reason why. So it must have been that incident in the Air Force that got me into it. Wow. Um, tell me about your time in the Air Force. How, how detailed was that for you? Is that a major component of your early um, early life? No, actually, I joined to fly, uh, but I wasn't able to make the flying program. So I I, I spent two years in the Air Force, and uh, then what? Then I uh, was was let out. So it uh, it was an interesting time, and that's where I had that experience. So being on that Air Force base at that particular time, evidently, that was very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, you know, a lot of people are uh, fascinated with the Serpo exchange program. Um, in your opinion, in the best um, logical, rational um, explanation of that and details, tell us uh, the synopsis of the Serpo exchange program for what it is, um, and then tell us about the research that's going on or surrounding the Serpo exchange program. Well, it all started with Roswell. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was because one alien survived the Roswell crash that all this became possible. Mm -hmm. By the way, the, the, Ros the Roswell crash involved two craft, not just one. Uh, many people may not know that. Two alien craft collided over Roswell, or, or rather around 75 miles northwest of Roswell, mm -hmm. and they were both from the same civilization. It was a strange mix-up. Uh, they There was a very, very powerful lightning storm that night, and plus that com combined with the radar, the very um, strong radar over that particular Air Force base, I think caused them to collide. And uh, one of the craft crashed 75 miles northwest of Roswell, and the other one limped on westward 
and came down somewhere near Dayteal, New Mexico. Now, that one wasn't recovered until 1949. Nobody, but nobody really knew where it was or what it was. But the one in Roswell, there was one survivor, and that alien was made the difference and started the whole chain of incidents that ended up in the Serpo story. Uh, he was taken to Los Alamos laboratories where mm -hmm. the, sci the scientists there questioned him and learned how to communicate with him. And eventually they found the communications device that had been on the craft uh, worked when they put it back on the, on the craft, on the crash disk. It worked with the power system of the craft, and they were able to start communicating with his home planet. In 19, roughly 1948, that began. No, I'm sorry. The, the communications didn't begin till 1952. They could not get that device to work for, for five years, and it was only in his last year, just before he died, that they were able to get it to work, and he sent six messages to his home planet one of which suggested an exchange program. Now, he made that suggestion presumably at the, uh, at, the, at the behest of his military handlers, and that in turn probably went all the way back to Eisenhower. So um, that, was the, that was what first triggered the whole mm -hmm. circle story. Mm -hmm. And that became a reality when President Kennedy came into office. Do you think... Kennedy being aware of that may have been eliminated because of the knowledge? The Kennedy story is a very complicated one. There were a lot of other people that didn't like him uh, and hated him. and uh, But a lot of people now in the UFO community are beginning to believe, putting all the facts together, that he knew too much and he was prepared to, re to reveal it. Mm. Mm. And, uh, of course, he didn't know a lot about – they denied him a lot of information. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he did not know what happened from the time of the Roswell crash until he became the president. That nine-year period, in that nine-year period, we had already reversed engineered one of the alien craft at the Nevada test site. So we had a working, by the time he became president, we had a working uh, anti-gravity aircraft. <clears throat> but he didn't know that. Sure. <clears throat> but he did know about Roswell. The six communications that they sent back to Zeta Reticuli, uh, I believe Zeta Reticuli is relatively close in terms of the, the, the Milky Way. It's something like 37 light years or something like 30, that. 30, yeah, 39, 39. 39, is it? Or, okay, so it, it, in terms of uh, other star systems, that's pretty close. It's in our backyard, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. It is rather close. And we're on, we're on their trade routes. We're on their trade route. Mm. These, these six communications, do we know the nature of those six communications? Was each one the same communication or was there different messages sent each time? I can give you the content of each one of them. Hold on one second. That would be great. Um, no doubt there was a military. Um, it wasn't like we, we have one of your members come and save him. Um, no doubt there was a military. Well, actually, that was. That was one of them. Here, here are the six. The first one was just letting his planet know that he was alive. The second one explained the crash and the death of his crew. I guess he was the crew leader. Yeah. The third asked for a rescue craft for him. The fourth, and now the reason he asked for a rec rescue craft, let, let me explain that, okay? Mm -hmm. The only reason he would do that is because he knew that there was a mothership in orbit. He would not have done that if he was asking for an interstellar trip to come and get him. Sure. We'll get to that in a minute. Mm. The, fourth, the fourth message suggested a formal meeting with the leaders of Earth. The fifth was the one that suggested an exchange program. And the sixth message provided landing coordinate, coordinates for any future rescue or visitation. Uh, he probably, that was, that was a guess because he didn't really understand our numbering system at that point. So uh, that, they were not really valid uh, coordinates. In any case, those were the six messages. And it was the fifth one that got picked up. Uh, by Kennedy. Wow, wow. The, the exchange program, um, <clears throat> outline the details of the exchange program. I guess that's the, the basis for, for what we're going to talk about today. Well, the exchange program was that we would send 12 of our people to their planet for a period of 10 years on an alien, on their craft, and uh, they would leave one ambassador behind here. And if you go and take another look at Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you'll see that they did leave one person here in that movie 
And we'll talk about the movie later, but because uh, the movie was accurate, very accurate. Uh, so that was the deal. That was the deal. We would send 12 people there. We would learn all about their culture, their uh, weaponry, everything. They were, go- they were not going to, st- to hide anything from us. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was a very inviting proposal to our people, especially to MJ-12, because we needed to understand their propulsion system. We wanted to know a lot about their technology that got them here. 39 light years, and we uh, we were curious about why uh, human body parts were found on the Roswell crash. They were. There were human body parts, although they were not cannibals. They did not eat human flesh. That was another whole story right there. So uh, we needed to understand all of that because that information was like a gateway to the galaxy for us. It, oh, it would be incredible, incredible uh, advancement of our technology. <coughs> So the the rescue craft was in our own solar system. Is that what we're saying? We're saying that there was a mothership close to us, or relatively close to us, not not in Zeta 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 Reticuli. It was pretty damn close to us. Exactly, and that's never been talked about. But in my book, I have a whole chapter on the Kingman incident. I don't know if you read that or not. Uh, We we realized very quickly that that small craft that they sent here that crashed at Roswell could not possibly have made an interstellar journey. So uh, we, using the communications device, after the alien died in 1952, we kept communicating with his home planet. And we evidently established that they did indeed have a, a, a mothership in orbit. So we suggested, why don't you send down another craft so that we can analyze it and reverse engineer it? And they agreed, and they agreed to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that craft landed in Kingman, Arizona, in uh, 1953, it was taken on a tank trailer to the Nevada test site, and we began to reverse engineer that craft, and we succeeded by, by 1962. We had one working, and we had a simulator working also. So Kennedy did not know that. All mm-hmm. he knew about was that Roswell crash and the suggestion for the exchange program. They did not give him all that other information. They didn't, they didn't think he needed it. The transcripts of these six communications, how has this got leaked out of the military? Surely this has got to be highly prized information. How did this get into the, the public domain or the researcher's domain, then the public domain? Well, you know the story of Anonymous and how he leaked this information. Mm-hmm. To You don't know that? And parts of it. Okay. In, the, in November of 2005, he started sending uh, emails to this uh, this web, this uh, UFO thread list, which was a thread list consisting of a, about 150 UFO interested people who were basically insiders. They were ex-military, ex-intelligence. This was not just a group of uh, UFO people interested in UFOs. So he knew he was leaking the uh, information to the right group. Mm. And over the course of the next few months, he sent 21 emails, each one describing the exchange program in detail. And the reason he had the information was because he being in the DIA, <clears throat> he was retired at that time. I uh, had been involved with the program uh, in in the in the 60s, so he knew all about it. Plus, he had the uh, complete 3,000-page debriefing book in front of him. Uh, the aliens that the Americans that returned from Serpo in 1978 were debriefed for a solid year, uh, and that became a 3,000-page book. So that's how he had everything in front of him when he started sending the messages. Has a lot of this information been corroborated <clears throat> through the names or anything else? Has, has, it, has this been soaked into other areas of research? Well, you can, you can, I'm sure you can believe that whatever we learned from the Ebens is incredible military technology, mm-hmm. and therefore we have that technology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's being kept under lock and key at Bowling Air Force Base in Washington. Why do you think Kennedy was kept in the dark? Why Was there a rogue faction there protecting this information from the time of Roswell onwards? Absolutely. Absolutely. MJ-12 was in charge of everything. And MJ-12 consisted of 12 individuals uh, appointed by President Truman to deal with the alien, uh, deal with alien um, matters. And they didn't feel that uh, he was ready. They felt he was too interested in revealing everything to the public, and they didn't want it revealed. Mm -hmm. (coughs) That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. 
This is counterintuitive to what people normally think of the American governmental system, where the president knows everything and then he has an entourage. Whereas with the MJ-12 um, phenomena, uh, this is not really the case. This is a clandestine group, um, probably from the 50s, 60s onwards, from Truman anyway. But it seems to be now that there's a shadow government, and that's kind of been like that permanently for the last 50 plus years. Absolutely. It exists. And uh, at that particular time, Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA, he had many irons in the fire and a lot of things that he knew the president did not know. And he did not share that information with Kennedy. Uh, ironically, he was on the committee the, that, that was supposed to investigate the assassination. So that's, that's like putting the, the fox in with the hen house, in the hen house. <coughs> I, I'm guessing then, you know, with the with the contact between the, any uh, contact between any life form, less focus on the Zeta reticuli incident uh, with the the entity that was captured. This has got to have a resurgence, a massive resurgence in motive and and um, all sorts of military activity. Um, this is going to just put everybody on a certain. Um, alert state um, and a renewal of motive um, Russia's not the baddie anymore it's gonna or you know they'll always be there but I mean this is a new this is all, all hands on deck this is a new phenomena a new situation well we were dealing with other uh, we were dealing with other ET races at that time also so and that's in my book too I talk mm -hmm. about that mm -hmm. uh, but this was a very critical one because these people were so friendly and nice and so willing to share their uh, information with us. Uh, they didn't ma have to make any deals with us. It was just strictly, whatever you want to learn, we'll tell you, period. Mm -hmm. And that, that, was pri that was priceless. That was priceless. Wow. Yeah. Do you think perhaps mm -hmm. um, he died of natural causes then, this this Zeta Reticuli, this, this entity that they had? I think probably it was, di it was difficult keeping him alive uh, here on, on Earth because of uh, they were a very different kind of a physiological structure. Their bodies were very different, everything about them. And I think we tried hard to keep him alive, but we just didn't have the technology. We just didn't have the biotechnology at that time. We didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I know in your secret journey to Planet Serpo, you talk about the, the 12 people. Let's, let's talk about these 12 people. Are they... Uh, surreptitious, clandestine. Do we know any of the members? Can you elaborate on these twelve, the majestic twelve? Oh, they, the the Air Force put an ad in the in the military journals asking for volunteers for this program. <coughs> they did not tell them all the details. Um, when they did actually get sixteen, they got five hundred replies. Uh, they actually had to go out and recruit a couple of people because the five hundred did not did not cover what the specialties they were looking for completely. So uh, they uh, had to reduce that to 16, 12 primary and four alternates. And so it was the 16, that's how they, that's how they, they got the, uh, the people. They were volunteers. They, one of the requirements was that they be unmarried, uh, that they have be orphans, preferably be orphans themselves, have no children, have very few family ties. Uh, they wanted people who were basically would not be missed if they never came back. Mm -hmm. Wow. So these 12 people that have gone to, to the Ebens home planet, uh, what have they said? Does anybody know what they've said about it, what their documents have released? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in my book, I have the, uh, I've reproduced the commander's diary. Mm -hmm. We have 12 pages from the commander's diary. So, uh, we have a lot of information. Yeah, basically, uh, they they uh, got there, and the first thing they noticed was there were two suns in the sky. Uh, they had a reticulized dual dual star system. Oh wow! The temperature was extremely hot, but they put them in an underground uh, location, so it was a little cooler. And they gave them freedom to do whatever they wanted. They, we brought uh, our people brought 45 tons of equipment and supplies with them. Including uh, three jeeps and ten uh, motorcycles and all kinds of measuring equipment and food and uh, music to listen to, so they were completely self-sufficient. Really, they could have been almost uh, the entire time, but 
a lot of their stuff ran out about the sixth or seventh year. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, where do those Majestic 12 at today? The 12, 12 people? Yeah, where are they at today? <clears throat> the last one died in 2002 in Florida. That's all we know. Only seven came back. Seven came back. What happened to the five that was out there? Just... Okay. Uh, they were all given three-digit numbers, you know. That's how they refer to each other, three-digit oh, right. numbers. Uh, the one called 308, who was an assist, uh, a pilot, uh, he died en route to Serpo. <laughs> mm -hmm. He... Uh, he had a pulmonary embolism, and uh, when they got to Serpo, about two or three years into the program, uh, two others died. Uh, one was a security man, and one was a doctor. Then, uh, after that, two of them decided to remain on Serpo. They didn't want, they didn't want to come home. So that's why seven returned. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, can we tell anything about the infrastructure of uh, the Ebens then, um, their technology, their infrastructure, their, their country? Well, what we discovered was that basically they basically had a police state. They were very highly regimented, very highly controlled. They had certain jobs to do every day. Uh, they, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, sure, sure. I'm getting some feedback. Okay, I got it now. Um, they they had some, they wore something on their belts that instructed them what to do all day long. Uh, they would move from one activity to another under uh, control, under uh, direction. But they also had a lot of fun. They uh, they had feasts and they had uh, they used to like to dance and sing and everything else. So uh, b even though they were so highly regimented. They were happy people. They seemed to be. Mm -hmm. But they, they led very simple, controlled lives. Wow. Um, what do we know about how long they've been visiting uh, Earth? Do we have a time frame of that? Did they talk about that? Did they release all the knowledge or were they a bit protective on anything? The first landing in April of 1964 uh, was at Holloman Air Force Base. That was, that was what we've call the ceremonial landing because we had 16 of our people waiting for them there and they presented us with a gift called the yellow book the yellow book was absolutely amazing uh, device <clears throat> and uh, it gave us the complete history of their interaction with us and of also of the of interesting things that happened throughout the galaxy in that period of time so we had a complete history of planet Earth from about 2000 BC uh, in the Yellow Book. Wow. And the, it was an amazing piece of equipment because it looked like a book, but um, it was really like a block. Um, let see. I'll give you some more information about it. Hold on. Sure. Uh, in any case, the uh, it told the story of their interaction with us. But the amazing thing about it was that there were not actually words on a page. When you opened it up, holographic images sprang out of the book. And uh, the words with it were in whatever language you spoke. And we determined later that it was capable of understanding roughly 80 languages on Earth. Uh, so this was an incredible gift to the people of Earth, and, uh, uh, hold on just a minute. Incredible technology, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was provided by the, it, it isn't exactly a book. Here's what, here's what on, Anonymous says about the book. It's the alien's history of our universe written by the aliens themselves, as well as their interactions and involvement with Earth's development and evolution. It was brought to Earth and presented to the U.S. government at the famous Holloman Air Force Base landing in April 1964 by female EBE number two. Now, EBE number two was a was a female alien who actually could speak English, and she was invaluable. And she also became a very valuable resource when our team got to uh, Serpo. Now, here's what else he says. He says uh, it isn't exactly a book; it's a block of material approximately two and a half inches thick and transparent in nature 
and appearance, the reader looks at the transparent surface, and suddenly words and pictures appear. It is an endless series of historical stories and photographs of our universe, the Eben planet, and their former homeworld. Uh, Serpa was not their original homeworld. And other interesting stories about the universe. It also contains a historical narrative and various accounts about Earth's history and, and our distant past. So this was an incredible gift given to us by the Ebens. Did they ever have any uh, opinion uh, of the nuclear program that we run on this planet or anything like that? Did they f ever tell us what they thought of us in, in terms of a, a humanitarian way or anything? Did they, did they let us know their own philosophy of us? Anonymous, Anonymous doesn't talk about that, but however, they were they were surveilling our 509th bomb group, which was the, which was the nuclear bomb group, and all of our nuclear uh, development capability was in that area of New Mexico. So, evidently, that's what they were interested in. Uh, when we got to Serpo, we found that they did not have nuclear energy. However, they had other energy that was far in advance of that. So. But evidently, they were interested in the atomic bombs. That's why they were there. Um, was there a transfer of knowledge um, for the benefit of mankind, or was there just a basic transfer of knowledge uh, with whatever was asked for? Well, needless to say, we learned a great deal of, uh, while we were there, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in terms of their biotechnology. Their biotechnology was the most astounding thing we learned there. Um, they were not anxious to share a lot of their technology with us, but any any questions we had, they answered. And we learned about the, propul the propulsion system on the craft uh, was was given to us. We understand we got to, all that information, and that included uh, traveling through wormholes and also antimatter propulsion. Uh, so. Whatever we learned was kept has been kept under lock and key uh, at the Defense Intelligence Agency. It hasn't been revealed, but evidently it's been used uh, regardless, mm -hmm. and it had a lot to do, I think, with a lot of the advances that were made later. Um, you talked about the human body parts on the crashed craft. Um, does that imply abduction, or does that imply? Um, uh, research into biotechnology. What what does that imply? Does anybody have any answers on that? Yeah, when we got there, we discovered that uh, the the Ebens had a very very sophisticated biotechnology program. They were they were retrieving specimens of creatures from all over the galaxy in their travels and bringing them to uh, to Serpo, and uh, we found that out through our interest in. Um, finding out what happened to the body. We wanted to know what happened to the body of 308. The commander was determined to find out. They told him that the body no longer existed, that they had used it for their research. So he was he was uh, furious about that. He said that body belongs, belongs to the U.S. government, planet Earth, and uh, we want to see what, what's left of it. And it became a confrontation, and it almost escalated into a uh, a real serious event. The commander realized, of course, his position was very, uh, very untenuous, and it wouldn't be a good idea to continue with it. But he demanded to see the body, and they took him to this laboratory where they were growing these creatures in tubs using uh, bio, using genetic engineering. And he was completely revolted by what he saw there to the point where he said uh, in his diary, I have seen the dark side of this civilization. Of course, they didn't view it as evil. To them, it was just science, and they were just simply experimenting with all these creatures. And uh, finally, he said he wanted to see the body, what they had done with 308's body. And the doctor there told him that they had cloned it. They had created a clone who was partially part even and part human. And uh, he said he wanted to see that entity, and they took him to see it. And he wrote in his diary that uh, it was a very strange creature. It had large hands and feet uh, like human, but the other part of it was more like a an even. 
And after that, he said that he had enough. He wanted to leave, and they walked out. So we learned a lot. They, they had a lot of advanced technology because they understood DNA at that time, and we did not. Because in, in, the, in the mid-60s, we didn't know very much about DNA. Uh, we just discovered it really in the late 50s. And Watson and Crick got the Nobel Peace Prize, I think it was 1958. So we had a lot to learn, and uh, at that point we thought of it as rather an evil practice. They didn't consider it such. And they were very free free to give us whatever information we wanted about it. Very scientific, and, uh, as you're saying. I mean, did they have any um, concept of spirituality or religion? Did, did they express that, or did anybody see anything of a spiritual or religious belief? They, they did have a religion, and it was very similar to what we would call the Catholic religion here in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Uh, they believed in a creator, and they also believed in reincarnation. They had, they had ceremonies when one of the, one of them died. They had ceremonies that were, uh, uh you might be interested to, <laughs> you might be interested to learn. It was very much like an Irish wake. Oh, really? Yeah, because they, after the, after the very somber ceremony, they had a great big party. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, they understood a lot about what was going on, but they weren't really in what we would call, I would, what I would call very spiritual, but they were very kind and generous people. And we were very fortunate to have the relationship with them because for that reason, they shared everything with whatever we wanted to know they shared with us. What can you share about the technology that they had? Perhaps the propulsion system. Um, I mean, do, do we do? Is it even conceivable in our own science? Is it, is it a new type of science? Yeah, absolutely. They they had anti gravity uh, on their planet. Their their craft. So they had they had craft like helicopters, but with without um, without uh, blades. They just used anti gravity. And their uh, vehicles traveled over the road without wheels. They just, they were anti-gravity. So we knew, they knew anti-gravity, but also they had free energy. They were able to extract energy right out of the vacuum. Now this was not, this is really not new to us. You know, we, Tesla knew about that. And uh, as a matter of fact, the Tesla coil uh, used that same technology. So, uh, that's one of the one of the ways they were able to power their their spaceships. Uh, they could they could pull this energy right out of what seems to be a vacuum, but really isn't. And they also had antimatter propulsion on board. Uh, but the real travel to and from uh, their their star system was through a wormhole, and travel through a wormhole is virtually instantaneous. So they traveled vast distances across the galaxy almost within seconds using wormholes. So putting all that together, uh, we evidently got our hands on all of that technology. We must have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did they um, get involved in a hybrid program? Did anybody have any sort of a, um, from the Zeta Reticuli, or is that, um, was that a taboo subject to them? They never abducted anybody. They did not believe in abductions. Uh, we found out later, actually, Anonymous says in, in his, in his emails that the, the grays, the ones we call the grays, those entities with the wraparound eyes, mm -hmm. uh, they are not the same species. And Anonymous says that, that the grays are really not from Zeta Reticula. He says they're from Alpha Centauri. So, uh, and the greys, of course, we know are the ones doing all the abducting. And of course, the greys are tied in with the, with the reptilians. So it's a whole different civilization, completely different. Did the Zeta Reticuli have a relationship with any other ent entities that did come to Earth? Were they um, colluding or um, networking with anybody? They had traveled throughout the galaxy. They had a lot of uh, friends, and uh, but the greys... The gray civilization was not one of them, um, or the reptilians. From what we can determine, they didn't have anything to do with the reptilians, which was very interesting because, as we all have learned now, they're not exactly good guys. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were a civilization all to themselves. They kept to themselves, but they did, 
they did travel a lot and they were spiritually advanced in the way we would we would we would identify somebody who was spiritually advanced uh they were kind and generous people and uh that was that was how we really evaluated their spirituality um do you think then perhaps that the Nazis may have had um, some sort of a collusion with the Tito Reticulos or other races as a result of this era that we went through? The Nazis had a pact with the reptilians. They didn't have anything to do with this group at all. Uh, that pact was made in 1933 between Hitler and uh, the reptilian civilization, which has a, which has a huge underground presence uh, in India, under India. And uh, that's how the Nazis got their hands on all of that advanced weaponry. Um, do you think they went to Antarctica? A lot of people hypothesize that these guys were down in Antarctica, um, secret caves down there. Uh, which guys are you talking about? Sorry, the Nazis. The, the Nazis and these uh, sort of yeah, positions. the reptilians. The reptilians are known to have a, a base under Antarctica, and that's that's the reason. That's the reason that the Germans uh, went down there and built a, uh, a colony down there. And that colony became huge. Uh, they called it New Berlin. Uh, they started building that, that base in 1938, before World War II. So evidently, their connection with the reptilians started around that time, because they had no other reason to go to Antarctica if they hadn't been invited there by the reptilians. Did they tell us anything about our solar system, like cataclysms or solar events that may affect us in the future or the past or anything like that? They might have. We don't know. Uh, all I know is that they were debriefed for a solid year. They were kept in isolation and debriefed for a solid year after they returned. And uh, it became a 3,000-page book. And I'm sure if we could... If we get our hands on that book using the Freedom of Information Act, we know all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I think the Yellow Book also gave us a lot of that information. Mm -hmm. this, the, uh, uh, by the way, Anonymous says about the Yellow Book. He says, uh, "To this day, I am one of the very few people who has actually seen and read the Yellow Book." As has been commented on by others, it would take a lifetime to read it and another lifetime to understand it. Is Anonymous the only source for the, the, the secret exchange program? Is this, has this surfaced in other areas as well? I'm sorry, say that again. Sorry, could, did Anonymous, did the Anonymous guy, did he, is he the only source or did this surface in many other areas of research, this exchange program? Well, of course, uh, it led to us, uh, reverse engineering their craft, uh, at the Nevada test site and coming up with our own, um, our own anti-gravity craft. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the other information goes, I'm sure it's been leaked out to what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. And that's how we were able to develop interstellar space travel, which we have. Mm -hmm. We now have that. We now have Star Trek. And uh, we've had it for some time now. And I'm sure we have craft that are very much, very much like the Enterprise, and we have a system very much like Star Trek already. So you must, you can be sure that a lot of that came from the Serpo story, the Serpo adventure. Mm -hmm. Had to, it had to. Why do you think it took until 2005 for the Anonymous to, to, to release the Serpo? Is it, is it for humanitarian reasons to awareness of the public? No, according to the law, information that was hot, top secret could not be released to the public for 25 years. The final report on the Serpo story was written in 1980. So Anonymous revealed, released it in 2005, 25 years to the day wow. that he was permitted to do that. Yeah, so, and he waited for that long, he waited for that length of time to, to, release, it, to release it. But he followed the law. Now, wow. the bottom line is this. Mm -hmm. MJ-12, and uh, the secret government, what you would call the cabal. There are many people in the government, in the intelligence community, and in the military who are very well-intentioned and well-motivated. Uh, the cabal, I think, is a small group. Mm -hmm. And those people wanted this information to come out. They want the public to know this. 
they want to start releasing it as, as much as they can, as quickly as they can, but they, they have to follow the rules. Wow. Um, where do you think the research is today? Do you think XL politics is a good thing? Do you think people should get involved with XL politics and, uh, um, you know, to start a political uh, off planet awareness of what's going on? Absolutely. We're already doing it. We have basically have a diplomatic relationship with the Ebens mm -hmm. and probably many other civilizations. And uh, now something even more startling is coming out about our relationship with uh, civilization on Mars. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the with the revelations made by Randy Kramer, are you? No, not at all. Um, Please enlighten me. Well, uh, Randy Kramer was in the super soldier program and was dispatched to work to uh, to a, an account on Mars. Now that's a whole another story that uh, you, you should get into mm -hmm. by inter by interviewing him, because uh, he spent t 17 years on Mars in a military detachment. So that's that's something that needs to be known also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does there, uh, w when the exchange was finished with, on Planet Circle, did they um, ever talk about another exchange program in the future? Is that is it all ceased since that exchange of ideas and beliefs and um, was closed doors after that, or is there going to be anything happening in the future? The, uh, the Ebens came back to Earth uh, nine times that we know of after that. Uh, the last the last visit was in two thousand. The last visit that I know about was in 2000 and, uh, see, 2010. Let's see, hold on. Yeah, November 2012 was the last last visit, November 2012. So they've been back three, eight times that I know of. And uh, that last one, or the one in 2009, they landed on Johnston Island in the mid-Pacific. And uh, at that, that time, we invited other countries to participate, including China and Russia. Mm -hmm. China and Russia both had representatives at that landing, and also the Vatican. Uh, at that particular meeting, that was the one in 2009, two, November the 10th, the Vatican, the United Nations, uh, Russia, China, and uh, 15 other Representatives from our country were there to greet them. So we we're, we've let the word out. We haven't kept it tightly controlled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, you know, I had Steve Bassett on recently with the Paradigm Research Group, and that, and that's great. And I think there is a disclosure happening. I think it's definitely in in motion. Um, you know, it's do you, do you not think there's like a public uh, blindness to this that they just don't want to know? I mean, even if you had an open flush, do you think okay. they're going to have to just come back and land in front of all the TV cameras before people wake up to this stuff? Yeah. Well, that's that's the interesting part of this. Uh, and I wrote about that in my first book, Secret History of Extraterrestrials. I wrote about it. I said the next, even if it was revealed tomorrow, people would go back to work the next day and all with their with their economic and romantic problems and they, they wouldn't have time to even think about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but slowly, it's it's actually filtering out into the consciousness more and more through the UFO people and through Hollywood and through various other sources. Uh, it's starting starting to penetrate, mm -hmm. starting to penetrate, and it, it's the story. It's the story. It's, it's the actual the major story that everyone should be concerned with because it because it affects everything. Mm -hmm. But it's it just it's just penetrating very slowly. Uh, when you were uh, studying with the Edgar Casey Foundation, ARE, did you ever come across anything in the writings that Casey talked about uh, contact with civilizations? Did he prophesize any of that, or was that just mostly airspace stuff? As I recall, I read a lot of the Casey readings in Virginia Beach. Uh, he did make a couple of references to life. In, uh, he did make a couple of references to life in the universe. And, uh, but I can't recall exactly what they were. Uh, I think he did talk about it. And if you get into the readings, 
uh, and get into great detail in the readings. You'll find some information there, but I can't remember what it is. Sure. Um, when the Zeta Reticuloids had this uh, history as far back as 2000 BC, uh, did there anything, did all of it match our own known history or did anything stand out as being just blatantly wrong or slightly wrong? Or Well, you know, uh, Anonymous doesn't go into great detail about what he learned from the Yellow Book, but one of the things they did discuss was that the aliens seemed to know about the advent of Jesus and they did talk about him. And at one point, um, it almost appeared as though they were claiming that he was one of their own. But uh, really, Anonymous says that really wasn't the case. They just knew about him and they discussed him. Uh, and of course, you can be sure that they uh, they talked about how the human race evolved on this planet. And from what I've been able to decipher, uh, it certainly wasn't Darwinian in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, Glenn, we're at the top of the hour. Um, tell people the website where people can get a hold of you again, and of course the names of your books and where people can get a copy of your books. Okay. If they come to my website, uh, et-secrethistory.com, uh, they can click through to Amazon or to Barnes & Noble and buy the book that way. Uh, if they want an autographed copy, they can uh, get it from me or they can get it from the publisher. So from the website, uh, they can get whatever they need. And uh, I've also got a lot of other information out there besides just information about my books. So uh, that would be the place to start. Well, Len, I really thank you for your time today. It's great to connect again. I know we had a mishap with the time differences and, uh, um, of course, missing emails on my part. But listen, great to talk to you today, Len, and thank you for the rescheduling of the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a great pleasure, James. Hi everybody, welcome back to Capricorn Radio. This is your host James and uh, my third show today. This has become quite an, an exciting week for me. I'm really glad to talk about today's subject because it's something uh, I've been aware of for quite a while and uh, I'm super excited to talk about today's guest. This is going to be talking to Mr. Len Caston. A little bit about Len before I bring him on. Um, Len Caston has a BA degree from Cornell University. That's where he majored in psychology. And he minored in literature and philosophy, so we're going to be guaranteed a good discussion today. Uh, after graduating from Corn Cornell, he entered the U.S. Air Force Aviation Cadet Program. And was there, uh, he experienced a UFO encounter that had a transformative effect on his life. Although he didn't realize until a few years later. Uh, and after serving in the Air Force, he moved back to Richmond, Virginia. On frequent trips to Virginia Beach, he spent a lot of time in the extensive New Age Library at the Association for Research and Enlightenment, the ARE. Uh, the organization founded by psychic Edgar Cayce, uh, who we've covered on a few shows. And uh, that's where he acquired a self-education in metaphysics. He then moved to Boston, where he was introduced to theosophy and joined the Boston Theosophical Society. Then later, while working in Washington, D.C. in the 60s, he felt drawn to join the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, that's known as NICAP. NICAP was the most prestigious organization in the country investigating UFO phenomena. Len then moved to Hartford, Connecticut, where he joined the American Philosoph Philosopher Society. And upon the death of the founder, Cyril Benton, Len became the president of the society. It's then in the 80s that the APS, under Len's leadership, commenced a program of weekly public lectures by prominent metaphysical and ufology researchers, writers and leaders. While living in Connecticut, Len became the... To Los Alamos Laboratories, where mm -hmm. the, sci the scientists there questioned him and learned how to communicate with him. And eventually they found the communications device that had been on the craft uh, worked when they put it back on the on the craft, on the crash disk. It worked with the power system of the craft, and they were able to start communicating with his home planet. In 19, roughly 1948, uh, that began. No, I'm sorry. The, the communications didn't begin till 1952. They could not get that device to work for, for five years. And it was only in his last year, just before he died, that they were able to get it to work. And he sent six messages to his home planet, one of which suggested an exchange program. Now, he made that suggestion presumably at the, uh, at the, at the behest of his military handlers. And that in turn probably went all the way back to Eisenhower. So, um, that was the, that was what first triggered the whole mm -hmm. circle story. Mm -hmm. And that became a reality when President Kennedy 
came into office. Do you think Kennedy being aware of that may have been eliminated because of the knowledge? The Kennedy story is a very complicated one. There were a lot of other people that didn't like him uh, and hated him. and uh, But a lot of people now in the UFO community are beginning to believe, putting all the facts together, that he knew too much and he was prepared to, re to reveal it. Mm. Mm. And, uh, of course, he didn't know a lot about – they denied him a lot of information. Mm -hmm. he, he did not know what happened from the time of the Roswell crash until he became the president. That nine-year period, in that nine-year period, we had already reversed engineered one of the alien craft at the Nevada test site. So we had a working – by the time he became president, we had a working uh, anti-gravity aircraft. <clears throat> but he didn't know that. Sure. <clears throat> but he did know about Roswell. The six communications that they sent back to Zeta Reticuli, uh, I believe Zeta Reticuli is relatively close in terms of the, the, the Milky Way. It's something like 37 light years or something like 30, that. 30, yeah, 39, 39. 39, is it? Or, okay, so it, it, in terms of uh, other star systems, that's pretty close. It's in our backyard, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. It is rather close. And we're on, we're on their trade routes. We're on their trade route. Mm. These these six communications. Do we know the nature of those six communications? Was each one the same communication, or was there different messages sent each time? I can give you the content of each one of them. Hold on one second. That'd be great. Um, no doubt there was a military. Um, it wasn't like we we have one of your members come and save him. Um, no doubt there was a. Well, actually, that was that was one of them. Here, here are the six. The first one was just letting his planet know that he was alive. The mm -hmm. second one explained the crash and the death of his crew. I guess he was the crew leader. Yeah. The third asked for a rescue craft for him. The fourth, and now the reason he asked for a rec rescue craft, let, let me explain that, okay? Mm -hmm. The only reason he would do that is because he knew that there was a mothership in orbit. He would not have done that if he was asking for an interstellar trip to come and get him. Sure. We'll get to that in a minute. Mm. The, fourth, the fourth message suggested a formal meeting with the leaders of Earth. The fifth... The editor of an early New Age publication, Metamorphosis Magazine, co-founded with Gordon Michael Scallion. And uh, what a prolific uh, background of a bio to get into today. So many aspects there. Uh, if you want to follow uh, Leonard, you can have a look at his website. You can go to et-secrethistory.com and uh, you can catch everything he does there. Um, so without further ado, let's bring on today's guest. Hi, Len. You're very welcome to the show. Hi, James. Nice to be with you. Oh, great to have you here. Len, what a wonderful background you have. Uh, philosophy, psychology, theosophy. Uh, you've even had a UFO character yourself and uh, into the Air Force as well as a, as a cadet. Um, a lot of aspects to your personality uh, and background and life there, Len. Uh, which do I go to first? Uh, I, I guess the, the big one would probably be the UFO counter, but... And to be uh, to be polite, I, I think it's best to know the person. Tell me about you as the psych psychologist, the philosopher, um, and what attracts you to that um, part of part of uh, uh, education. I think I think that inc incident that I had in the Air Force. I think I was taken on board a, a craft, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't remember all the details. But evidently, that's what happened in uh, in my subconscious that. It, that that ex that incident was buried there until I joined NICAP in Washington, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I became very very interested in UFOs. And I had no reason why, so it must have been that incident in the Air Force that got me into it. Wow, um, tell me about your time in the Air Force. How how detailed was that for you? Is that a major component of your early um, early life? No, actually, I joined to fly, uh, but I wasn't able to make the flying program, so I I I spent two years in the Air Force. And uh, then what? Then I uh, was was let out. So it uh, it was an interesting time, and that's where I had that experience. So being on that Air Force base at that particular time, evidently that was very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you know, a lot of people are uh, fascinated with the Serpo Exchange Program. Um, in your opinion, in the best um, logical, rational um, explanation of that and details, tell us uh, the synopsis of the Serpo exchange program for what it is, um, and then tell us about the research that's going on or surrounding the Serpo exchange program. Well, it all started with Roswell. Mm -hmm. uh, it was because one alien survived the Roswell crash that all this became possible. Mm -hmm. 
by the way, that the, Ros the Roswell crash involved two craft, not just one. Many people may not know that. Two alien craft collided over Roswell, or rather around 75 miles northwest of Roswell, mm -hmm. and they were both from the same civilization. It was a strange mix-up. Uh, they There was a very, very powerful lightning storm that night, and plus that com combined with the radar, the very um, strong radar over that particular Air Force base, I think caused them to collide. And uh, one of the craft crashed 75 miles northwest of Roswell, and the other one limped on westward and came down somewhere near Dayteal, New Mexico. Now, that one wasn't recovered until 1949. Nobody, but nobody really knew where it was or what it was. But the one in Roswell, there was one survivor, and that alien was made the difference and started the whole chain of incidents that ended up in the Serpo story. Uh, he was taken 